periodic table today. You started this yesterday when you guys did your little activity. That was a, a great uh, illustration of how historically the, the periodic table came into being. You guys got all these um, stick figures, remember? Yeah, from yesterday, all these different stick figures, different numbers of hair, fingers, arms, all that stuff. And you, were, you had to put them all together somehow or other. You had to put them all together and make uh, a pattern so you could predict guys who were missing. There was one guy I, I took out of there. It was a different person for everybody. And you were able to do that. That's exactly what the guy who invented, the, who created the periodic table did. And he did it. And you know it's what he did because he didn't know much more about what he was doing than you did. You didn't know at the time that you were making a periodic table. Okay, you didn't know, you had no idea that's what you were doing. He was just looking at the properties, what they look like, and how heavy they are. And he just he realized that certain things repeat. The guy who did this, by the way, his name was Mendeleev. That's how you pronounce it. He was a Russian scientist. But look at that date, 1872. In 1872, people, no one knew about quantum numbers, electrons, outer shells. They didn't know about any of that stuff. I mean, Dalton's atomic theory was only a little bit before this. We didn't really have a whole lot of information about the atom. So he knew nothing about atomic numbers, protons, neutrons, electrons, isotopes, uh, energy levels, nothing. How did he do this? How did he come up with almost very similar, not exactly the same, for a lot of reasons. First of all, not all the elements were, were discovered at that point. But also there were a few guys who may have been out of place. But he did exactly what you did. He realized that every now and then things repeated. He organized them in, you know, how heavy they were. And he realized, hey, you know, every now and then some things looked alike. If you look at my little uh, poster I have here, you'll see that all the guys in group one, for example, they're all silver Silvery, shiny metals. All the guys over here in group eight, they're all gases, and they don't react with anybody. And you also realize that's another thing. The way these guys reacted with other compounds was similar. So the, he basically classified them all, organized them by similar properties and increasing atomic mass, and he created what was to become the periodic table. Same as you guys did. It's exactly what you guys did. You didn't know when you were making yours that the number of hairs was supposed to be the valence shell electron. You had no idea. You were just going by the hairs. He didn't know that the reason noble gases were unreactive is because they have a filled octet. They didn't know anything about that. But he still put them in the same row because it group because they, they looked alike and they acted alike. And that's what you did. Now that's useful. We have an entire chapter today. We're going to start this whole chapter on the periodic table because we're going to be able to use this forever. For the rest of this year, you have to understand and use the periodic table. Okay? <coughs> he was able to do something else you guys did. I removed one of those stick figures from your uh, set, each set. You were able to draw the missing stick figure. You knew how many fingers he would have, how many arms he would have, what his body shape would look like. You, ha you got to do all of that. You got to create, or not create, but um, draw the missing guy. Mendeleev did the same thing. There were elements that hadn't been discovered yet when Mendeleev did the period, put his periodic table together. And he realized that. For example, germanium here was not discovered at that time. He realized that gallium was a very much like aluminum underneath him. And arsenic wasn't at all like silicon. So, you know, he realized there's got to be somebody missing. He was looking at who was above and who was below and who was to the side. And he said, somebody's definitely missing here. Okay? And he predicted within a very small percent error the boiling point, the melting point, what it would look like, what its atomic mass would be. He was able to predict all this stuff about elements that had not even been existing, had not even been discovered yet. Just like you were able to draw those. That's what he did. All right? Same exact way. Okay, it's a really neat activity. That's why I started off with it. It's always best if you don't know what's going on. I'm glad no one told the afternoon classes because they obviously didn't know what's going on either. Because if I told you it's supposed to look like a periodic table, you probably would have been done in five minutes, probably less. Okay, But you didn't know that. It took you 20 minutes, 25 minutes. But the difference is that's exactly what he did. And it just shows you you can do it. Okay, It doesn't require you know, uh, genius status to do this. 
Okay, so that's the history of the periodic table, and that's one of the. I said we don't get a lot of scientists. Last uh, chapter on atomic structure, we got a few, uh, but this guy is one of the other big names in chemistry. You should know Mendeleev. He discovered. Wait, he created the periodic table. All right, let's talk now about the modern periodic table. Now, what I'm going to mention today on this board right here is stuff we already know. I'm just never wrote it down anywhere. I don't think we've been using the periodic table to do our electron configurations all last chapter. You guys know that. You know you were using it. It was shortening life up for us, wasn't it? If I wanted to do the electron dot notation of oxygen or, or for somebody big like iodine, I didn't have to write out 53 electrons for iodine. All I had to do was look, he's in group 7. I know how many electron dots are in his outer shell, right? And you wanted to do the shorthand notation for any of those guys, you used a noble gas, you were able to tell what his notation would look like because of where he was in the periodic table. Well, there's certain things that I never actually wrote down into your notes. Let's write them all down now. The names of things, what they're called. One of the reasons I'm taping this class again this year is just because of something we're going to get to in a little bit. I always covered it. I always explained it, but I never called it that. I never called it this, this law, this word. And so I'm going to actually use that word today. It's not like a big deal. We're not changing anything, but, you know, that's how, uh, you know, the AP exam is. They get very, very picky about stuff. And uh, even though I felt I explained it, you know, you got to have the right word there. So here's some stuff we already know about the periodic table. First of all, it's arranged not by increasing atomic mass like Mendeleev did, but by increasing atomic number. That's important. And by the way, a good source of a trick question on the test. Mendeleev organized his by how heavy they were because he didn't know how to get the atomic numbers of all the elements. But if you, can you look over there and see some guys that might have been out of place for Mendeleev? Are there guys over there whose atomic mass doesn't get bigger, but rather gets smaller? Can you see ones? Which one? Nickel? And copper, yeah. Nickel and copper, according to Mendeleev, poss quite possibly, I don't know, they're pretty close together, could very easily have had those mixed up because their atomic masses actually get, go down. We know now it's not how heavy, there's other places over here too, uh, tellurium to iodine, right? Uh, and there's other places where this happens. And it has to do mainly with the number of neutrons that you have in an atom. But here's the point, guys. We now organize by atomic number. Why? Because that's what determines an atom. Remember my classic example from the atomic structure chapter? I asked you, I pointed to carbon. I said, what do we call carbon if I take away an electron from him? What's he called? What's the word? Take away an electron. An ion. What do I call carbon if I take away a neutron? An isotope. A different isotope of carbon. Well, what do I call carbon if I take away a proton? I call them boron. I've removed a proton, so I've changed the atomic number. The atomic number tells me the identity of the element. If I change that, I change his identity. He's no longer carbon. Okay? So that's why we have them organized by increasing atomic number. In general, atomic mass follows that, but atomic mass isn't why something is what it is. Okay? Atomic number is. Okay. Uh, some other things we already know. We already know the word period. I've been using that. I never wrote it down anywhere. I never wrote down the word period or series. By the way, another, another synonym for a row in a periodic table is a period or a series, the horizontal row. We now know from last chapter what that corresponds to. You also know even from doing that little thing yesterday what those number of arms corresponded to. Corresponds to what? What does that tell you about an atom? Joe? Period. The peri yeah, the period tells you the period. That's a great, terrible answer. How many points am I going to get for that on a test? I asked that on a test, a multiple choice question. What does a period mean? What does a row mean in a periodic table? And he tells me period or series. Is that going to give me any points? What does it mean about the atom? Same reason why you would have gotten points in doing that little activity yesterday. What does it mean? What does that row tell you? We know this because we used it. You used it to get the notations. What does that tell you? Somebody. I, I, I can wait. 
Someone's going to remember. What do you think? The highest energy level. Never heard that before? Because if you never heard that before, my question is, how in God's name did you ever do any notations that required shorthand notation? Because that's what we did for several days. To do the shorthand notation, you had to know. The last thing I ended up with for Argon, for example, was 3P. 3P because it's the third row down. 3 corresponds to the highest energy level or the principal quantum number. Some of you are out there thinking to yourself, you mean you, you wanted me to remember this? And I have to remember it next chapter too? This is crazy. I can't do that. That's what real science is like. You don't just learn it. First of all, that's what science is like, period. But it's not like history. Oh, we covered World War I. Don't ask me about those guys anymore, or those battles, or those generals, or those uh, presidents. Now we're on World War II. Ask me about those. I don't have to remember the ones from World War I. That's not how it goes for an AP exam. It's not how it goes in science, especially, because you're going to build on itself. Okay, so it tells me the highest energy level. That's Phil. And by the way, that's why, and one of the things I've also noticed about this chapter, I'll just give you back those tests, one of the reasons I feel that the grades were much lower. Take a look, if you will, sometime over your Skyward grades. Your homework from the first chapter is probably a 10 out of 10 for everybody. Homework for the next chapter, probably maybe a 9 or a 10 out of 10. The last chapter, for most people, homework grades, a very few 10s. Very few people got all their homework done. They said, I don't need to do all that homework because that's just you know, repetitive. I don't give repetitive questions. If I gave you repetitive questions, I'd say, okay, do all the odd ones at the end of the chapter or do all the even ones at the end of the chapter. I don't do that. I specifically choose the ones that you need to know. And if you, like a lot of you did, oh, well over half of you did not get full credit on the homework this chapter, this past chapter. Don't be surprised. That, that reflects on your test grade. So I don't need to practice this. Yes, you do. Everybody should have known the period or series is the highest energy level. We, if you had practiced this more often and done more of those problems, you would have known that. It would have been stuck there. Okay? So, anyway, this is all review. We already knew this. We already knew that the group, by the way, you didn't know it was called a family, but you knew what the group was. The group is that vertical column of elements. And if you noticed something about the uh, activity you were doing yesterday with those guys, those little uh, stick figures, they all had something you I don't think anybody got correct because you wouldn't have known it. I'm, I'm saying it right now. They all had the same patterns in their bodies, didn't they? They all had squares, or they all had diamonds, or they all had triangles. If they were in the same group, they all had similar body uh, patterns. You know what those body patterns would have meant? It meant similar properties. They look alike and they act alike. And we call them families for that reason. I've had members of your families, okay, for the most part, it's probably about half of you I've had a, either know or had a member of your family. And you look similar. You may not always act the same way, but you look alike. Okay? And I can usually tell that. Uh, so that's the same. That's why they're called family. That's why they're called, uh, uh, the, the guys in the vertical groups are called families, because they look and act alike. I told you already. Everybody in group one, silvery, shiny metals. They all react the same way with water. Uh, guys in group eight, they're all gases that don't react with anybody. And it's similar for a lot of the other guys, too, okay? The groups tell us the valence electrons. You should remember, uh, certainly everybody remembers that. The valence electrons being the outer shell electrons, you all had to know that to be able to do the electron dot notations. And we've been practicing that for a very long time. So I don't think anybody would forget about that. So look at all the stuff I could already tell. All this is review. I just never wrote it down anywhere. Now you got it down in your notes, okay? Uh, one last thing. I can actually, what's in the block itself of the periodic table, the actual element itself, all right, the actual element contains a bare minimum of this information right here. And I want you to write this down, even though it's pretty obvious that it's got to be there, because there's one thing I have not uh, been taking off for, but I will. I haven't been taking it off because I really haven't made this point yet. So just copy all this down. That's all the information that's contained in, in each element. And I want to talk about it in a second.
Now, obviously, some of these things are, are, are easier than others. They obviously contain the element's name and um, atomic number. And by now, we all know what they mean. I certainly hope, after this is really the third chapter now since we learned this, because last chapter was on electrons, the chapter before that was on um, uh, atoms in general, and that's where we first got this. The atomic number being the number of protons, okay? It's also the number of electrons if it's a neutral atom, but that's not the number of electrons, it's the number of protons, it's the atomic number. But the average atomic mass, you have to realize that's an average. Remember doing those? Average atomic masses? That was with the pennies. I had pennies from 1982, before 82, and after 82. We did that little activity, and we did calculations with that. That number up there that you see, 15.999 for oxygen or 12.011 for carbon, is an average of all the different isotopes of carbon. If I'm holding a handful of carbon, I'm holding all the different isotopes of carbon. All right, that's the average mass of that. That's all well and good. That's all great. You don't really think about that on a regular basis. But this guy right here is the one I haven't been taking off for. One of, the, one of the problems I gave you in the test was to do the notation for cobalt. And some people wrote down, preferably not in green, that. Now, I didn't take off for that because technically it's, uh, well, the, the dots are correct, right? Cobalt is in one of the transition elements, and he's in, he basically has two electrons in his outer shell. But what's wrong with that? That's not cobalt. What is that? Carbon monoxide, okay? This is cobalt, okay? And that's what the correct answer should have been. Now, I didn't take off for that, but from now on, you got to have the correct symbols, capital and then lowercase for symbol, because we're going to be writing formulas very soon. And if I have something like that, I have to be able to tell if it's capital or lowercase, especially in compounds like where I've CNO, carbon and oxygen, as well as cobalt, I have to tell the difference between them, okay? All right. And it's not just, it doesn't just happen with carbon and oxygen, obviously. There's all, many other elements that if you don't put the capital letters down, you can get it mixed up. Um, capital in one case, I should say. All right. Um, that is the end of the review of the uh, stuff you already know. Now it's time for the trends. Now let's talk about these trends. This is the new stuff. We're going to spend the rest of this chapter, believe it or not, talking about the four trends in the periodic table. Don't copy this down, obviously. I'm just going to show this to you. We already know so much. We can already predict so much about an atom based on where he is in the periodic table. You know, I pick a guy who's, like, right here. I know so much about him. I know what his highest energy level is. One, two, three, fourth row down. Fourth energy level. Principal quantum number. Four. I know what shape is he filling since he's in this block right here. What shape is he filling? Orbital shape? P. Right. This is the P block. This is the D block. This is the S block. Right? And this is the F block. This is not surprising to anybody. Correct? So I know what highest energy level. I know what shape he's in. I know, since this is Roman numeral four, group four. How many outer shell electrons does he have? Four, right? I know all this stuff about him already. But I'm actually going to teach you now four things you don't know. And they're biggies. They're big things that you have to be able to use to predict in the future. The reason we're showing this right now is in the future we're going to be able to tell just by where somebody is located what kind of compounds he's going to make. Would this guy want to get together with this guy or not? And if he does get together and make a compound, what would that compound look like? What would his formula be? You can't do that unless you understand the periodic table and where these guys are in it. All right, so I'm going to talk about, right now, four trends. I'm only going to get to one of them today. I'm going to do one trend today, and that is going to be atomic size. I can tell how big they are. And you might think, well, this has got to be easy. I can predict this. And you're right, and you're wrong. <laughs> you're right. Some of the atomic size stuff is blatantly obvious and easy, and others is deceptively confusing as to what would happen when you go across or down a periodic table. Let's take a look. If I'm looking at a group, within a group, okay, write this down. If I'm talking about within a group, and I go from top to bottom in that group, okay, from top to bottom, you don't have to, obviously you're not copying this. What do you think? A guy down here, Francium, the bottom of the group, uh, or a guy, you can't see it on the video here, I'm going to put it over a little bit. 
a guy over here like Barium, okay, at the bottom of the group, is he going to be bigger or smaller than a guy up here, Beryllium? What do you think, Kirsten? Yeah, everybody's going to say bigger, and you're all right, okay? From top to bottom, the atomic size is going to increase. But the answer to why it increases is where you're going to go wrong, where you're going to lose points, because it's not necessarily the answer that's correct. I get a lot of bad answers, and you're going to have, you saw that, I just showed you the test a little while ago for this new chapter coming up. You got at least three short answer questions. I will get some really bad answers. Let's go, let's go over the first horrible answer I get. I'll ask, what happens to atomic size as you go down a group? And explain what happens to it. And people will say, uh, atomic size um, it gets bigger because the atom's getting larger. Okay, that doesn't answer the question. You're just restating the obvious. It's not getting bigger because the atom's getting larger. Obviously, it's getting bigger, all right, and the atom's getting larger. My question is, why? Why? Why do you think? Why is this guy getting larger as I go down the periodic table? Anybody know? Give me some answers. What do you think, Joe? The number of protons. Number of protons is increasing. Absolutely wrong. Hard to believe. But actually, what Joe just said is the exact opposite of reality. If I just increase the number of protons, the atom isn't going to get bigger. It's going to get smaller. It's crazy. I'll explain why in a little bit. So. Anybody got a better idea? What else? What else happens as you go down that gr group? You may notice. Somebody said in the other class. They get big, heavier, right? More mass to them. They're more massive. Still not good enough. Doesn't answer the question. Think of what happens as I go down a group. Think about what happens as I go down a group. What's, I'm going to a new row each time, right? Correct? What am I adding as I go down there? An energy level. Absolutely. And remember the definition of an energy level? An energy level, people, was one of the few things about these terrible models. One of the few things that was correct about the bad models was that the energy levels are shown as being further from the nucleus. The definition of an energy level is the average distance from the nucleus. So that's why, as I go down this group, as I go down this group, Sorry. There we go. I am adding an energy level each time. So this guy right here, he has only one energy level. This guy here, he has two, three. Okay? They're, that's why they're getting larger, because you're adding energy levels. Write that down. You're increasing the number of energy levels. That's a big difference, guys, than saying it's because there's more. Say, so, well, that's the same thing because you, you know if you're adding protons, you're also adding energy. You're adding both. No, because watch what happens as I go across a period. What would you predict based on your prior statement as I go across a period? If I look at this period, I go across. Take a look at a guy over here. Look at a guy like bromine or krypton. Krypton's got 36 electrons, 36 protons. Potassium only has 19. As I go across, krypton weighs 83.7 grams per mole. This guy only weighs about 40. So it's like double. He likes double the mass, double the number of protons and electrons. And yet, guess what happens? From left to right, atomic size gets smaller. It gets smaller. It decreases. Why? Why does it decrease? Well, that is a little harder to explain. It doesn't make any sense that it should decrease. They're twice the mass, twice the number of protons, twice the number of electrons on this side than I had on that side, yet its size is less than half. Well, I'm going to show you a little graph up here in a minute. You're going to see that. You know why? What charge do protons have? Positive. What charge do electrons have? Yeah, and I might go on a, when I go across a periodic table, when I go across, am I adding any energy levels? No, I'm just filling up inner ones, right? I'm just filling up the ones that I have. So what I get over here is a heck of a lot greater positive charge than I had on this side of the same energy level. 
And what that serves to do, it's like two stronger magnets, pulls the electrons closer to the nucleus. That's what actually happens. You end up with that. Write that all down. It's a long statement. And it's actually got a name to it. It's the only reason I'm recording this class is because I've always explained it this way. But there's actually a name to this phenomenon that the AP exam would like you to know and use in your answers. And that's what I'm going to give you next after you copy that. So something weird happens as you go across, something you would not have predicted based on just what your uh, you know, common sense would seem to show. Krypton has twice as many protons and electrons, weighs twice as much, so does bromine almost, and yet he's smaller. Would not have predicted that, but now you know why because I've got more positive charge from the protons, okay, pulling in those negatively charged electrons, and that is called a special law. It's actually called Coulomb's law, which I have to put up here. That's the last thing we're going to do. Okay? All right. Now, Kevin's missing this class because he's copying what he missed before. Give it back. Give it back. And just listen to what I'm saying now. It'll make way more sense than missing two times. Two, two times and stuff. That's called Coulomb's Law. Okay, write that down right underneath what you just wrote. And basically, what it, mean, what it says, here's a definition of Coulomb's Law. It's actually a physics term. Definition of Coulomb's Law, it's the force. Basically, hold on a second. I got a phone call. Hello? Yes. Um, okay. Wait, wait. Hold on. She's not here right now. She's uh, she's asking for that. Okay, bye. Okay. So this is the statement of Coulomb's law. It's, here's what it means. This is what it says. And again, this is more of a physics concept, but it can, it's obviously applied. Because Coulomb, for example, is a unit of uh, charge. And uh, we actually use it a little bit in, in uh, AP Chem when we talk about electrochemistry. We talk about Coulomb, we do some calculations with Coulomb's. But Coulomb's law basically says, hey, it's a really simple law. It sounds complicated. But it really is just saying the stronger the positive charge and negative charge, the stronger that charge, all right, the greater that charge, the stronger the force of attraction. And actually... It's inverse, inversely proportional to the, I, I forgot a word in there, the square of the distance. That should be a square function here. The square of the distance. Okay, the square of the distance between them. It's actually pulling, in other words, just because I've got twice, if i got twice as strong the charges, it's going to pull them not half as close together, but it's, the distance is going to be half as great. It's going to be one half. It's going to be squared. It's a squared function, okay? One fourth. So if I look at the size of these guys, if I look at the size of this, y'all got the copy? You'll notice that here's potassium way over here, and here's bromine, and he's way smaller. Okay? As I go across the periodic table, He's significantly smaller by not just even half, uh, having double the positive charge of the nucleus. But it's a pretty simple rule. It's just saying that the greater the charge is, the stronger the attraction, and the closer it's going to pull the um, to it. There's actually an equation for it, which they do not expect you to know, nor do they give you on the, the exam. So I'm not going to give that to you. But basically, that's all it's saying. All right, now, that's the only new part of it. I never uh, covered that in um, chem... Uh, in the years past, just because they didn't call it Coulomb's Law. All right. Now, here's the last thing I'm going to say before the bell rings here. This one trend can be used to predict all the other ones, believe it or not. It can give me a starting point. And I'm going to start do that tomorrow. I'm going to show you how, if you know this one trend, instead of memorizing the four trends I'm going to give you, you can use this trend and say, okay, this guy's really big down here, and this guy's really small up here. I know what he's going to do with this next trend. And you'll be able to do that just starting tomorrow, okay? And the second thing I want to just hint at to you today, but you're going to talk about it more tomorrow, is I'm going to put these things in graphical format as well. 
You guys are really bad at interpreting charts. All right, and that, you know, is even on the SATs, which you've taken, I'm sure, or will be taking. Okay? Being able to interpret a chart like this, what is that a graph of? Right now, you look at that and say, I have no idea. But you will. Because we're going to, this happens to be the same trend I just showed you and just talked about. How could that be the same trend? Because here is the atomic size decreasing as I go across a period. And here is the atomic size increasing as I go down a group. And you're going to see that. We're going to relate to that every single day of this week and next. I'm going to have a chart up here. Different charts for the four different trends. And you on the test will have to explain and interpret that chart. Okay. All right, your homework is on the board up here. Copy that down for tonight. That's your homework. And we're done. Long class.